And I'll let you move your head up and down to the right and to the left. Okay, but that's it. You can lick your lips, yes. <laughs> but that's it, Jamal, all right? All right, let's make Jamal sweat it out for a little bit. Let's go to story number two. Story number two, let me preface this a little bit with how God works in my life to see if God may work the same in your life as well. When, after I graduated from John Carroll University in 2004, I did some volunteer service in a little town called Immokalee, Florida. In Immokalee, I uh, did work for Habitat for Humanity, Catholic Charities, and probably my toughest job was teaching first graders in an after-school program. Nonetheless, the nice thing about volunteering in Immokalee was that you get to go to the beach on the weekends to relax. Well, I went to the beach, and unfortunately the weather, kind of like today, wasn't a very good day, it was snowing, but it was certainly a lot of rain. And so I went to the local bookstore just to pass the time. I went in there, and I was just kind of walking around, and I caught out of the corner of my eye a book. And the book's title was S-E-X, Sex. What's a young man do? I'm going to go check out that book. Maybe there's some pictures or something. I pick up the book, and it said, Sex, God's plan for chastity in your life, saving sex until you're married. Darn, put the book back up, started to walk away. But, you know, something made me go back to that book that day and pick it up, and I ended up reading about 100 pages. And I was kind of convicted that I hadn't been living my relationships in a godlike fashion. I hadn't been treating the women I was dating really in a holy manner. And guys, you'll, you'll talk to a lot, maybe your parents, maybe teachers, who say, look, I don't regret anything I did. It's in the past. It is what it is. I'm here to tell you, I regret some of the things that I did. I wish I hadn't done some of the things I did with the women I was dating. Some things are really meant to be saved for that special someone that you're meant to marry. So I ask you, I, I plead with you, I invite you, just consider, uh, no matter what you've done this past year, what you've done this past weekend, what you did last night, be a man or woman called to be holy as Christ our Father and God our Father has asked us to be. Alright, so you can kind of see though how God uses something attractive in my life to kind of get my attention. And then he has his own purpose and message for me. Well, same thing with my second story. Miss Tennessee. Now, I've changed her name so you can't go Facebook or anything like that. But she's a beauty pageant queen. She came to speak to my high school my senior year. And she was gorgeous. I mean, everything I wanted as an 18-year-old young man. She had long, long hair, long legs. I mean, the full package. She was intelligent. And so whatever she was going to talk to us about, I was going to agree with She was there right before prom to tell us, you know, don't do drugs and don't drink and things of that nature. But she could have told me... Uh, would you guys eat dirt? And I would have been like, yes, Miss Tennessee, whatever you said. With that being said, it was what she said at the end of her talk, which really struck me, which I wanted to share with you guys. She said, I'm not even sure why I'm telling you guys this, but when my mother was 16 years old, she was raped. And then she became pregnant from that rape. And she had a choice to make. Was she going to abort the child or carry the child to term? She said, I just want you to know I am that child. I am a product of a rape. I realized in that moment that God could take the most evil, awful thing. Can you think of anything worse than a rape? And turn it into the most beautiful. In this case, it was Miss Tennessee. But we as Catholics and we as Christians, we don't have to look farther than the cross to realize this. God took the worst thing that happened in human history. The death of his son. I mean, we put nails into the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And what did God do? Did he send fireballs down on earth to destroy us? No. He resurrected his son and gave us hope for eternal life. So trust and believe that whatever areas, whatever deep sins that you guys have or areas that you don't talk to other people about, God is right there in them working to bring out the better story, the ending, which we all deserve. Because all things work together for, for those who love God. All right? So that's lesson number one, all right, that God can always bring good out of evil. Now let's check back on Jamal. Jamal, how are you doing? Your face itches. Your face itches. It's a good example. Jamal, well, you just spent the past, uh, I don't know, four minutes or so, as my father has for the past 21 years of his life. Yeah. You see, guys, my father's actually completely paralyzed from the neck down. Uh, I'll tell you his story just very briefly. At age 11, he contracted the polio virus. So it paralyzed him once. Uh, luckily, he regained roughly around 50% use of his right arm. So he was still able to feed himself. And it would take him like an hour and a half just to get his pants on in the morning. But he was able to do it. He became self-sufficient. So make a long story short, he goes off to the University of Illinois. He gets his master's in journalism. He moves to Cleveland. He's working at the plane dealer. Getting a ride home from a buddy one night, they get into a car accident. They're smack dab in between two hospitals. They decided, to, decided excuse me, to take him to St. John's. 
And the first nurse assigned to his room is Mary Jean Cook. Um, a year later, they're married, they fall in love, and so your life can change on time, just like that. And he met his wife, you know, quite, and my mom, quite literally by accident, so you never know how things are going to go. Anyway, they have six kids, I'm the fifth out of the sixth kid. As my dad likes to say, not all of him was paralyzing. <laughs> all right, <laughs> a little slow this afternoon, okay. So, my dad has six kids, and in 1989, he's taking a pill to help him fall asleep at night, and also for some of the depression he was experiencing. But unfortunately, the pill is being made illegally by a company. It's prescribed legally. The psychiatrist who prescribed it didn't, didn't realize this. Uh, but the pill, it killed four United States, injured thousands more. It re-paralyzed my dad again from the neck down. So since 1989, every morning my dad wakes up, he stares at the ceiling, and he has to call out for help. Every day, my dad has to use the bathroom. My mom's got to take him on and off the bed again, and the one of the six kids who went home and wiped his backside. Or if he's got a booger up his nose, I mean, you name it, my mom has to be there to help him out for his every single need. But that despite the fact that my dad can't even stand up and hug his wife of 41 years, as you guys embraced each other as we began the talk, or one of the six kids, my dad still says yes, yes to life. My brothers and sisters, we live in a culture and society today which too often says no. It says no to the unborn child. Well, it might be mentally challenged, so let's avoid it. It says no to the unborn child. If, well, it might grow up in poverty, so let's avoid it. We need to be a people who say yes to all that life has to offer us. And look, I know life can get difficult. Just to be completely honest with you, Jamal, there's been times in my life where the anxiety and depression got so bad, I wanted to take my own life. I didn't think life was worth living. But thank God I had someone like my dad in my life who continues to say yes, yes to life. So that's the second lesson I want us to take today. It's just simply that we're called, and even rather, it might be our duty to say yes, yes to life. Okay, let's give Jamal a round of applause. Jamal, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Pass around this picture here. My dad is, as they say, a GLG. Do you know what that is? He's a good-looking guy. All right. <laughs> All right, third story, because I know I can get boring really quick. Um, as Mr. Uh, you know, Wisner has been introducing me all day, he's talked a little bit about the homelessness and uh, issues, and I'm definitely very much involved in that today. I work for a place called Opportunity House, which seeks to stem uh, homelessness among former foster care kids after they turn 18. Thank you. And um, so four out of the ten uh, young men that I live with actually were homeless for about seven to ten months. Nonetheless, at John Carroll, I also started to get involved uh, very much uh, with the pro-life ministry, and I would go to March for Life in Washington, D.C., so raise your hand. Has anybody been down to March for Life? What grade are you guys? You are? Uh, ninth. Ninth? Okay, you're right. Um, well, if you haven't gone yet, if the Leary Catholic or your church group offers you the, the opportunity to go, please do so. It's a very powerful experience. And, you know, any movement, including the pro-life movement, you have some people who are kind of out there and stuff, but for me, it's a very spiritual experience, and I always like to pray my rosary. I was down there again this year. So I was down there uh, back at John Carroll, when I was a junior at Carroll, and uh, I was marching along, and, you know, kind of praying my rosary, and I noticed again out of the corner of my eye, a homeless person had taken one of the signs that said, defend life, and somewhere he got a marker, he wrote on the back, am I not life too? I was like, holy crap, here we are all marching for life, we're all passing up life on the side of the street. So I went into my pocket, got me $2 out, thought I was doing my good deed for the day, went up to his hat, and dropped it in his hat there, and said, God bless you, and kept on on my way. Well, I got about 10 feet ahead, and he said, hey, where are you from? I turned around and said, well, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from Kentucky. I said, well, great, what does that mean to me? But I, anyway, I started, I went up and figured I'd engage in a little conversation. I was talking to, to him, his name was Dre, and Dre and I talk about everything that I talk about when we get together. So what do men talk about when we get together? Sports, absolutely. What else do men talk about when we get together? Don't know? Okay. <laughs> girls, absolutely. Amen, brother. All right. <laughs> so we talk about sports, we talk about girls, we talk about you know, all these different issues, right? We talk about how he ended up in D.C., and so on and so forth. But you can tell that Dre was just touched by the fact that I treated him like a human being. 